I'm Jake Bruton, and recently on The Build Show, I gave you the 20 questions that I ask every client in the first contact with that client. I today want to cover our elevator speech that they also get in that initial meeting. The intro speech, if you will, the uh, who we are and what we do speech. Let's talk about that now. Okay, the whole goal of uh, informing a client about who you are is to manage their expectations, is to paint a picture that makes you uh, more valuable. You know, it's a, it's a valuable, uh, it's a value proposition. It's the who we are and what we do and why that's right for you. Uh, I think of that quite a bit, who we are, what we do and why it's right for you. Uh, and it might not be right for you and that's what the first part is, is to determine whether or not it's right for you. But from a um, elevator speech standpoint, I always start with, uh, this is our 38th year in business. I'm obviously not always, because last year I said 37th year in business, but I always talk about how long we've been in business. Something like 98% of construction businesses in the United States fail within the first year. Uh, so having a business that has 38 years worth of roots is important. Uh, you should think it's important as a potential client. You should go, okay, they haven't screwed up bad enough in 38 years to put themselves out of business. They must be doing something right. Let's hear what they have to say. And I truly mean it that way. And I truly think that you as a client should view it that way. Not they're the ones because they've been in business for 38 years. It should be, we should check into them because they've been in the business for 38 years. And that's kind of the way that I add that into the conversation. This is our 38th year in business. There's a family owned business. I bought the company from my parents in 2007. Both my parents retired when I bought the firm. My dad's been back to work for me a couple times, but pretty much they've been out of the business since I purchased the business. That gives them a, I've ran this company since 2007 without saying I built this company to what it is today or anything like that that sounds braggy. I say I purchased the business from them in 2007. That gives them the immediate information to go, okay, well, he's owned the company for a third of the lifetime of the company. He must be doing something correctly too. And the reason I think that you should talk about that, if you've been in business even more than a couple years, is it shows track record. If you're new, if this is a new business, you should probably talk about how long you've been in the industry and avoid saying this is our sixth month in business. You should say, you know, I've been in the industry for this long, we've been involved with the, with the industry for this long, this is our expertise sort of thing. You change the value proposition there. You could talk about how you're interested in new and innovative techniques and because you're new in the business, those things are easy to apply. It might be more difficult for me uh, or for someone who's been in business for 40 years to say, we're innovating. Now, I can make that argument based off of track record over the last few years, so I don't think it's the same thing, but there's a different spin that you can put on things that is honest and legitimate at the same time. You just change your value proposition for that aspect of how long have I been in business. Uh, I always talk then about growing up in the business. Uh, you know, I started working for the company when I was 12 years old. First time I hand cut a roof by myself, I was 14. So yeah, I was the contractor's son, but I wasn't 18 years old and the contractor's son that was pushing a broom everywhere, if that makes sense. I was actually getting legitimate construction experience. And so we choose to, I choose to look at it that way. And I choose to sell it to people that way. I've been doing this long enough to understand what's right and wrong, or at least have an informed position on most things. Uh, I then go on to talk about, I have a degree in art and architecture. Um, that gives me the ability to say, hey, this aesthetically in a classical environment would be better. You know, this, this would be the aesthetic uh, application for this. This would be why I would recommend X. Uh, I also always tell people, look, I'm not married to you. I don't live here and I'm not paying for it. So I will give you my opinion. And if it's aesthetics, you have the ability to, uh, to make a change or to disagree and I won't be offended. You don't get to disagree on efficiency or durability or uh, methods of construction that have to do with structural issues or code things, things like that. But always on aesthetics, I will give you my opinion, but I will not be upset if you do not take it. Um, and then I talk about our firm as a whole, what we want to do. We want to build 
custom homes with three criteria. They need to be efficient, durable, and architecturally significant. And I always say architecturally significant, it's pretty pompousy. What I mean is pretty. Uh, because we're building for the future. We're building 500 year houses, we're building 200 year houses, however long they are. Uh, we want them to stay around. Uh, and if you think about the difference between a historic home and an older home is uh, basically who cares about it. If the house is really old but nobody cares about it, it gets bulldozed. If the house is really old and people think it's beautiful or they enjoy living there, then chances are they're gonna wanna preserve it and save it and not waste the materials and effort that we put into it. Uh, so if a house is durable, that means it doesn't you know, let water in every time it rains. You're not constantly having to fix things on it because it's falling apart because it was constructed poorly. If it's efficient, we also get to make an argument that it's comfortable and healthy and it doesn't cost an arm and a leg to live there. If we build something that costs $500 a month to heat a thousand square foot house, you're not gonna wanna maintain that house forever. You're gonna wanna get out from underneath of it, sell it onto the next guy or tear it down and start over. And so we need to be thinking about those things. Uh, efficiency begets uh, comfort and health. So if it's not healthy, if it's not comfortable, you're not gonna wanna maintain it. You're not gonna wanna live there. And if it's ugly, you're not gonna wanna live there. I realize that aesthetics are uh, totally up to each person. You can decide uh, whether or not you think something is pretty for you, uh, but we have a good baseline for historically things that are uh, interesting, you know, that are uh, beautiful. Uh, we can vary from that and experiment and find things that work. Uh, or we can just say, no, we're not painting the front door pink and the outside walls black on your colonial house. It just doesn't make sense. So we talked about how long we're in business. We talked about me and how long I've owned the business, my education. We talked about the goals of the company. Then I go on to talk about what working with us is like. I start with a pre-construction services agreement where we're gonna help you through the design phase. We're gonna be a checks and balances system for the architect. We're gonna provide you with pricing and timeline and a full scope of work so that if anybody wanted to bid the house, they would be bidding apples to apples against us and we would all be bidding the same thing so that you can see pricing is pretty fair, pricing is pretty average across the board. Uh, now, that pre-construction services agreement, I sell that as a, I'm not asking you to sign an agreement to build your house before we even have the plans in place to build your house and you have a final price. It also keeps me from needing to bid things for free. Our time is not free. You don't go to the doctor and when the doctor tells you, no, I think it's in your head, you're not really sick, you don't need anything from me, he doesn't then not charge you for the consultation. We should be getting paid for the work that we do. So we get paid for pre-construction, but I don't ask you to sign a construction contract right off the bat because not all the information's there. That being said, I've never had anybody that went through the pre-con agreement with us that then actually built the project that didn't continue to work with us. It's the perfect method for getting our foot in the door. It's the perfect method for them getting some skin in the game with our company. And I'm building a relationship and proving our worth from the beginning. From there, we'd have a pre or a construction contract and we would have a uh, conversation about cost plus, what it means versus fixed fee. I have a video on Build Show Network here that you can go and find cost plus versus uh, fixed fee so you know we're cost plus. I talk about how that works. I talk about our deposit process, how you have to have skin in the game to get on the schedule. Uh, we talk about whether or not they would be financing or paying cash for the project. That may change the timeline for our pre-construction services agreement. Uh, some people have more, more cash on hand up front, some people don't. So we're a little flexible with how we bill out for some of those things, uh, but we still get paid for all of those. The next one we talk about is timeline. We, we have to understand, uh, they have to understand what our timeline is. Now we talk about that in the 20 questions, what's, what's their timeline, and generally I'll make a note, but I will always say like, hey, you know, I, I told you in the 20 questions that right now we're booked out until 2022 or 2023. Uh, just so you know, it's order that you say yes. So if someone calls today and says, we want to sign pre-construction services agreement today for you to sign us, a, build us a house and we want to go ahead and sign a contract and we want on the schedule, 
they might bump what I told you. What I told you is good for now, and I can't make any promises. The other thing that I talk about is how long the construction process takes. So this is a, you know, this is a one-year build. This is a two-year build. From this phone call till the time we break ground, you're at least eight months because that's how long the design process will take. Or you're 12 months because that's our first opening. So you have to be expedient so that we're ready to rock and roll when your time comes up. Because if we can't start when we're supposed to start, we have to move on and start something else. I also talk about uh, how all of the material choices that can possibly be made beforehand, before construction starts, before the scope of work writing is finished, the better off you're gonna be from a cost standpoint. If I can lock in real numbers, you're more likely to get uh, exactly what you want in the end from a budget standpoint. And then there's always those weird like, well, is there a, is there a house on the property? If it is, that's not something we generally wanna be involved with demolishing. I can point you in the right direction. It's not really what we do, that sort of thing, or if we need to. And then I always end the conversation with, uh, building science and like the project management that we bring to the table. So I talk about the physics of how buildings work in a short, you know, two minute spiel about durability and energy efficiency, health and comfort, those sorts of things. And then I talk about the project management that we bring to the table. I make it clear in the first conversation that while we have in-house carpentry, we don't do very much of the carpentry on your new home in-house. We're really there as a support system for the subcontractors that we work with, which then leads me into the subcontractors we work with, for the most part, half of them used to work for me. Uh, I have 12 people in our community that have business licenses that we use as subcontractors, or 10 that we use as subcontractors out of the 12 that have worked for me over the years. And I, you know, one of our framers, I taught how to read a tape measure. That sort of conversation is what we have. Um, and then we just basically say, you know, the value that we bring to the table is planning and execution and oversight. And that's why you want to work with us. So who we are, what we bring to the table, that value proposition, that's an easy thing once you've heard the speech. And this video was what, 11 minutes, something like that. That speech, when I give it to clients, uh, barring any insert conversations that pertain to just them or questions that they have normally winds up being about five to seven minutes. It's somewhere in there. And I will note, I have that written down. I, I fully have all the talking points written down because the worst thing that can happen for me is I have something important that I want to share with them and I forget it in the moment. And I know that I might forget something. So I just gave up and wrote it down. Now that we do things on Zoom call, I can bring it up on the computer and read it and they understand that uh, I'm, or not, sorry, not they understand. I understand that they might see that I'm reading it, but it's the information that's important. It's not the fact that I had to read it to make sure I didn't forget anything. It's an important speech. Knowing who you are and what you bring to the table dictates what goes in that speech and it dictates how you sell yourself to, to people. So those are the two parts of our uh, pre-meeting phone call of our first Zoom call. And I think that you should take it very serious that you're selling yourself and you should take it very serious that you have to understand who you are and what you bring to the table in order to be able to be a better salesperson for your company. So thanks for watching the Build Show Network today. Go back and check out that 20 questions to ask every client video I published a while back. Uh, make sure that you uh, subscribe to the newsletter that way, every Friday morning, you get an email from Mr. Reisinger pointing out what Steve, Wade, Brent, myself, what we've all, uh, what we've done that week and what we've posted and what knowledge is being shared on the website. Don't forget to follow the Unbuild It podcast and myself, Jake.Bruton, on Instagram as well. Thanks for watching. Get out there and sell your company in a way that's uh, honest and effective. See ya.